What's up, everybody? Welcome to Ripstop on the Record, episode 53, I think. I'm Jameson. I'm Isaac. So, Isaac, I'm pretty stoked about this recording because I just got off the phone for like 45 minutes with fraud protection. So I'm kind of yeah. annoyed. Well, that's a fun way to start your Friday. Yeah, yeah, it was lame. And now I just keep checking my bank account, making sure that people aren't stealing my funds. Yeah, so, watch out for that these days. Yeah, dude, high crime, you know. Anyway, on today's episode, we are talking with Kevin Tim of Seek Outside. You may know them from their innovative shelter designs, their ultralight slash hunting packs, as well as some other really cool pieces like hot tents and stoves and whatnot. So we're going to chat uh, chat with Kevin here shortly. But first, a few updates such as new products. Yeah, uh, we got a few things coming for you. Um, we have new t-shirts. Outdoor Ink. Outdoor Ink t-shirts. So if you really like Outdoor Ink and you want to rep that brand, you know, you can get a t-shirt now. Um, let's see. What else? New colors yeah. of Ultra went live. Yep. Two new colors. Uh, gravel Gray and Silverado, or as some would say, Silverado. Silverado. Um, so those are both pretty cool. And Ultra 200, right? Yes. Ultra 200. Um, and we should have some new components coming soon. Um, can't say exactly next week, um, but we will have some new sizes of triglides and some new uh, webbing keepers and a few fun things. And lastly, there are seconds of X Pack V21 RS. V21 RS that should also be live next week. So if you want that, go get a discounted rate. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, seconds are. Uh, there's a slight blemish. There's no integrity uh, taken away in terms of structural or waterproofness. Uh, they just might have like a little dot or speck on them. So you can get a great fabric at a discounted rate. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the episode. Let's do it. Absolutely. So right out of the gate, I want to ask you about your DIY mentality. When did you become a DIYer? Um. Slightly before starting the company, actually. Before then, I had been, well, I guess I could step back and take DIY outside of the outdoor industry and be that I've always been relatively DIY-like, like I used to play in bands, used to do recording studio stuff, um, commercials. I built my own amplifiers and things like that. So there's been, um, and in fact, they were fairly well-regarded. Um, and occasionally some will pop up at guitar shows and stuff. So I've always been relatively, I guess, independent minded or independent thought. Uh, and then it just kind of carried over to the outdoor industry. What, of course you have to, um, probably have a level set. So it means you have to have a starting place on gear of the things that you use some things and be like, I don't like this, or I do like this. And it, literally it was stuff I'd used prior was a hodgepodge of what you could buy at REI, um, what I had gotten at thrift stores or flea markets and things that uh, friends had maybe given me or whatever. And so, and within that, there was some modifications as well. Like I had a black diamond pack, didn't really care for the framing, changed that out. Had a ULA pack, um, tried to make the framing a little more robust as well. And just, just a lot of things like that. I want to talk about this amplifier company more. When, <laughs> uh, when did you do that? What was it called? I want to hear about this. Oh, uh, actually, I did that in the 90s. Um, the naming was not very original. Um, <laughs> so I won't go into the naming, but you actually can Google me and Google like guitar amplifiers, and you'll probably get some hits from old forums and stuff. Interesting. And uh, the, uh, the naming, I didn't really have an intention of being in the amplifier business. Um, I had a repair shop basically, and I was self-employed uh, out of the repair shop and I built my own amplifiers. Then I would play a show and sound men would run up and they'd be like, Oh my God, you have the best sound I've heard coming straight out of an amp. <laughs> or, and then people started being like, Hey, can you make me an amp? And the first few were pretty homely. Um, they were, they weren't much to look at. Um, and then a, 
couple other people kept kind of goading me into making amps. And then there's even, I put my circuitry and other amps because people are like, I really want the look of an orange amp on stage, but I want the sound of yours <laughs> and stuff like that. So there was a bit of that. And then it was, I would say it was probably doing all right um, for just being a bachelor dude. But when I got married and had kids, I decided uh, that trying to support the family off of broke musicians <laughs> <laughs> wasn't really a great uh and that is funny so now i've been supporting them off of broke hikers and hunters you know <laughs> <laughs> this is a different type of dirt bag right <laughs> yeah yeah it's just a different type of dirt bag let's talk about seek outside yes uh, you said you've been an outdoors person or we've seen that you've been outdoors person for a while you've always been infatuated being in in wonderful places at what point did you change from being just a diyer in, in any form to creating your own gear? Um, there probably was a little bit of a transition, um, but it probably was the late 2000 zeros. So 2007, 2008, 2009. Yeah. I'd be using stuff and I'd, I wasn't trying to um, make anything. I was trying to have fun. And I would just kind of be like, I don't really like this or the way this does or, well, this this pack was very comfortable in the store. And then for about 30 minutes on your back um, in a, on an actual trip, you know, and just stuff like that. Yeah. So then I started um, just tweaking with things. And then probably the real impetus, and I, I have two stories, so we can go like bifurcating stories if we want, right? One story I can tell is that, as a kid, I lived out in a rural area and I spent a lot of time outside in, in central Wisconsin. And I built like forts everywhere in the woods around us. And so now I'm just still kind of doing that. They're just more <laughs> mobile and a lot lighter. Um, the other story I could tell is I was snowshoeing and I was trying to figure out a way that I could get my dad into a backcountry hunting spot and stay comfortable for a while. And I said, oh, you know what? Like a big old teepee made out of like parachute material, right? And um, I came home, told my wife. She told me it was the dumbest thing she ever heard. Uh, <laughs> she's never she's never been afraid to bust my chops and stuff. Um, it's amazing I have any confidence left. <laughs> you know, but uh, so... Uh, I, I kind of persistence because you don't get up a mountain and through a bunch of drainages without some persistence. So uh, I sort of persistence hunted the concept with her until I finally got some breakdown. And uh, the first the first tent we made was ugly. It looked like a witch's hat. Within three or four months, I was mostly using our tents, and uh, we had small ones and bigger ones for the family. And there was some thought at the time we had uh, younger children, probably eight and five. And frankly, it kind of sucked backpacking with them. You know, it really did. Um, <laughs> not trying to, you know, and it, not, it didn't suck as much as it did a couple of years prior, but there was no way you were going in without carrying 50, 60 pounds you know, when you're trying to carry stuff with kids and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so that was the start and, uh, then it grew from there. So those, uh, those early on tents, uh, did you all sew those yourselves or did you, uh, have someone else that you asked to sew them or how did that, how did that work we, out? We sewed the first few ourselves okay. and, um, they came out surprisingly good. I mean, there was one that we turned a six man that we used on a weekend on the white rim trail as a family. We did a vehicle supported uh, mountain bike thing around that in the spring. There were ones I used in uh, San Rafael swell with the two boys, you know, um, I used them hunting the first year. And then I don't know, after we did a few trips in them, um, my wife came around and said, you know, this really isn't a bad isn't idea. Bad. Yeah. This isn't too bad of an idea, right? <laughs> so we hired someone who 
was a more professional sewer instead of a hobbyist. Yeah. And we spent a few dollars and we probably made five, six, eight tenths, something like that um, on our own to, uh, to test out various things that we thought would be neat or not neat. And then we tested those throughout the bulk of the year and we decided to make a business out of it. That's, uh, that's really cool. Um, All right. And our first customer, let me tell you the story of our first customer. Okay. Um, a Royal Mounted Canadian policeman that lived at the end of the ice highway on the Northwest Territories. Okay. Which that sounds like a story. <laughs> it would have been, you know, you're hoping your first customer is like simple, like down the street. Yeah. You, you hand deliver the package or you mail it or you help them with instructions, <laughs> right? You know, but this was yeah. like a major test. And his very first trip was he flew across the McKenzie River and went on a muskox hunt. So I said to myself, we have to really step it up. Yeah, it was like, we got to make real gear. We got to make stuff that's above this level of, you know, because at the time it seemed like a lot of the companies were like, yeah, this is light. It'll last you like a good hike or, a, or mm -hmm. three months or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so we decided that we had to do stuff to try to make the construction and everything really hold up. Yeah. So other than, you know, the, the construction that you put a lot of effort and stuff into, what would you say are some of the, the features of your tents and your, your products in general that kind of set seeks out and seek outside apart? I would say in general, if I had to name one thing that we've kind of done is we've brought, more ultralight concepts to hunting and four season and expedition worthy um, gear. Yeah. Not saying that things weren't used there a little bit, but you know, there's we've had times like where well, maybe it was the second or third year in business. There was it was 2011, the last giant storm in Alaska. Um, one of our customers wrote in about how they survived it while everyone else was getting. Tents dropped to them from airplanes. <laughs> you know? um, wow! So that you know, but we we do it in an ultralight way, right? I mean, yeah. maybe larger, maybe smaller. We also make things relatively um, adaptable. So a lot of our shelters, you can connect an inner relatively natively, or a second wall relatively natively, or run a stove if it gets cold. And so they're relatively adaptable, uh, but they've also really kind of uh, um, proven the test. I mean, our failure rate on uh, shelters, packs, all that stuff in general is so exceedingly low. Uh, we know the other manufacturers and the other competitors within us, right? And then we know what's there and the other in, in the regular rec world and our failure rate is so low. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's mostly on tents. It's zipper pulls that get dirty that we replace mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and occasionally a stove jack that stove port that wears out. Um, or occasionally they'll have a mule that decided to create a door of its own <laughs> or, or a curious, <laughs> that could be a problem. Yeah, or, or a very curious bear that keeps coming around. Yeah. But but as far as our failure rate on guy outs, fabrics, tie outs, stuff like that, it's ridiculously low. And the same relatively on our packs. Um, our pack failure is, I just talked to, uh, emailed with a customer the other day who bought probably one of our first 20 packs. And he's wow. been using it on Kodiak Island for eight, nine years and hunting and he probably uses it 180 days a year. And he wasn't even complaining about it failing at this point. Uh, when he contacted me the other day, wondering about if he could go up to the next level, it was more that he was like, you know, it's just starting to look worn, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, 
yeah. fabric and stuff's just getting and it's like well yeah <laughs> i mean if you've got a thousand fifteen hundred days i mean i remember that year that he bought it he had sent me a a message and said that uh i think he had hauled out 11 caribou that fall with it wow <laughs> you know so oh. it's not like it's not getting used and i've also seen yeah. a message where they had uh this group on Kodiak stays relatively close with us, and we actually use them for some testing sometimes too. Um, and they bought they bought all our gear as just regular customers, but over time we've they'll make videos and stuff like that. I know one of the one of the guys, Philip Sherrick, to Sherrick, I think is how you pronounce it. He posts posts videos of his adventures on Kodiak on BPL, um, so he is an ultra lighter, uh, but. They had like a grizzly, they were doing an elk hunt on a fog mac and they had to move their gear and they had said they estimated they had 160 pound loads because grizzlies were messing with them that night. Wow. And uh, so it's not like he's been babying these packs for yeah. eight, nine years, you know? Yeah. I mean, occasionally a buckle or something breaks, but, you know, we, we make stuff so it's relatively easy and simple to fix we don't we don't yeah. take the philosophy of we need the world's biggest buckle so it never breaks we take the philosophy of you know it needs to be easy for you to repair by yourself you shouldn't yeah. have to go to a seamstress or something yeah i would imagine a huge part of the durability that you all are known for comes from extensive testing and r d do you have a funny story or what can you tell us about what Seek Outside does to prove those things before they ever hit the market? We do so many different types of tests <laughs> and wackiness. Um, <laughs> so let's say on shelters, um, a lot of times shelters will just winter at my place high in the mountains. Um, and then I'll take them out as well, right? But I'll, I'll look for just some really big storms and some really big wind. I used to hike around with a Kestrel um, and I used to have, and I had weather monitoring stations put up at our house as well. Um, so I had a pretty good idea what the weather conditions were so we could be accurate in conveying it um, to other people. So that's one thing. We also do field testing. We also send things out to different people like like we've gotten flack because so poly has gotten so much more popular right um and people say well it doesn't stretch yeah that's not necessarily true um but like we built so poly shelters and we sent them to the group on kodiak and we built them dyneema shelters and they said, no, thanks to Sopale, and we'll order Dyneema as soon as it's available. And they literally did, you know, um, yeah. that uh, along with backyard testing, taking it out on trips amongst ourselves and staff. And on the pack world, you know, drop tests. Um, I've taken packs, loaded them up, thrown them down hills, um, you know, uh, we do the same with drop tests. Uh, one of the big things is the lady who has worked as our head seamstress, really. She, one, she worked for Marmot when Marmot was in Grand Junction early on, like back in the mm -hmm. 70s, 80s. She's been around a while. Um, but she also did repairs for the local REI. So she saw how lots of things failed. And yeah. she really a lot of things there's the materials the overall design concept there's also how it's put together and doing and patterning it and putting it together in such a way that it's really hard to fail um, and that's kind of where you, you see that in different manufacturers um, some manufacturers are real good at patterning stuff to where a seamstress can't screw it up, and some manufacturers don't. And I'll give you an example. We had an issue um, on our packs. It was relatively limited, small issue a few years ago, but it was it was because um, the designer 
that was working for us at the time didn't leave enough in the seam allowance for where the frame anchors that occasionally certain seamstresses couldn't catch it the same way. Mm -hmm. And so we go back to the drawing board, we, whether it's patterning or whatever, then we do it. And then of course we do a lot of tests on the materials and there's times where we extrapolate things like for example would be like, you know, if I have designed an eight person teepee and I've seen it handle 70 mile an hour winds and be fine and 20 inch snow and be fine. I can extrapolate that to a six person TP if it's still taut and has a, all the same ingredients, attributes and construction methods. You know, uh, it's like, yeah. that isn't it. Now, if it goes up in size, say to a 12, that one probably need to start putting some testing into. So, and then there's other things like, uh, I know we've posted videos people have been critical of, um, but like uh, high performance leaf blowers, you can generate 100 mile an hour winds on the side of a shelter with that. And if mm -hmm. you're curious, like when you design a shelter and they're like, oh, this might be the weak spot of this shelter, you know, you can throw a 100 mile an hour wind on a leaf blower <laughs> at it and be like, yeah. okay, there's what we need to fix right there, or go ahead, actually did all right. You know, not yeah. quite the same as a swirling mountain wind, but it does let you kind of know what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it it looks like most of your shelters use a, a 30D Cordura sill nylon. Is that yes. right? Yes. So tell me a little bit about um, just how you, how you came to that. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that sill poly isn't your favorite or it doesn't seem like it is. Uh, just tell me a little about your your fabric fabric selection process. Well, we made that selection a long time ago. Um, the we didn't always use the Cordura based. We used a high tenacity version for mm -hmm. a while. Six six. A lot of people will say, "Well, they're the same nylon six six Cordura, whatever." Right. Um, in our testing, they've been very similar, but the way a Cordura one will tear is a little different. Um, and it's like the fibers are overlaid a little more and maybe a little more long chain, um, instead of abrupt end to end. Right. Um, so we have had at some point. This is going to be true for most manufacturers. If you have a really good supplier partnership, you're going to leverage that as much as you can. Yeah. And in this case, they've been very good to work with. Um, we have, I wouldn't even know. I mean, years ago, I thought we bought 50, 60 miles of fabric a year if it was put on a running roll. Um, now it's probably 150 or 200 miles if we put a year's worth of that fabric down. Yeah. Um, so they've been very good. We've tried different formulations. Um, so when we speak to things, we come from, I don't want to say a position of authority, um, but when we speak to things, like we have done sill PU combos um, because we wanted to keep higher waterproofing but make it a little less tacky and mm -hmm. the same thread underneath. And we had some issues of uh, with shelters when they would get four person and bigger. Um, we would have some issues where if a rip developed, the rip would propagate, right? And you, you say, well, maybe you shouldn't mm -hmm. have a hole in your shelter, but, you know, people can accidentally put a stake in the wrong spot. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, it, a happens. Wild, <laughs> it happens, right? And so we quickly turned away from doing that and back to a pure sill. Now, in the sill poly um, thing, we bought Sil Poly and we made some test shelters because actually um, part of the group on Kodiak was wanting to test one, right? So we sent them mm -hmm. one 
and they actually said, no, thanks. We prefer the 30 D cell. Um, hmm. I made one, a couple for myself. Um, I didn't necessarily see a, a benefit. It seemed to be, um, if anything, just as stretchy, uh, conceptually, maybe not, uh, but it seemed to be fairly stretchy. And then, um, we also made one and we sent that at a Dyneema shelter with someone on a three week trip, uh, the middle fork of the salmon. And it was in mm -hmm. late fall. So there was some weather and stuff. And, you know, after a few days, they gravitated to just using the Dyneema one only. And yeah. so, you know, and then us ourselves, we weren't, there wasn't anything we were super impressed with. Now I know that, there's people online that will say it's the best thing since whatever. And maybe in one and two person or smaller shelters, maybe there's a benefit and the strength disadvantage doesn't, doesn't show there. But in the larger four person on, on up sizes, um, you can see a difference in the strength yeah. when things go sideways and how that. I guess how we would articulate it to people is honestly, it's not a big deal to say, take our Cimarron, a Cimarron size tent out of Sopale. Um, it's not a big deal to take that and go up and camp in the mountains or where in the, in the desert and be able to walk out that day or within a couple days if the weather turns wrong on you. But if you do a fly in trip, say in Alaska, mm -hmm you can get stuck there for a few days. You can get weathered in. And like yeah. one of our friends last year, I did, we did a fly in trip and we were there and they, they told us on one day, they're like, Hey, if you don't want, if you guys can't get out today, it might be a few days. We had some friends that were on a different fly in trip at the same time. They didn't get all their crew out. One guy was back there for like five, seven days by himself oh until God. the weather cleared. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, you want the most trustworthy shelter you can find. Yeah. You know, sure. uh, I, I don't want to be look if the weather's bad and the wind's really whipping, I don't want to be looking at my shelter being like, I hope this <laughs> thing survives the night. I hope it does. Yeah. You know, so. One of the uh, questions I wanted to ask was asking about the design differences from a backpacking shelter to a hunting shelter. And one of the observations that I have from listening to you here is that it seems like ultimate durability is probably higher on the priority list than it is for most backpackers. Often that's, that's weight for people that are just going out, you know, for a few days on the AT or something. Um, is that a huge part of your selection with doing the sill nylon is just choosing the one that's going to ha have the higher tear strength. And then the follow up mm -hmm. question is what other design features do you look at when you're creating a new hunting shelter? So the, that is correct. The, and it's, and I wouldn't necessarily pin us as a total hunting company. Uh, we're probably totally. about 70% in our surveys of people that partake in hunting as one of their primary activities. Um, but I would say that there's a difference with going out during summertime or shoulder seasons and having the option to relatively easily walk out within a day and you know that your chances for just legendary storms are going to be fairly minimal versus, you know, it's fairly common to get 16 inches of snow during second hunting, second rifle here. Even if the weather generally looks pretty nice, like at elk camps, I've 12, 18 inches of snow and usually, and frankly, it also, that time's usually the best hunting from a hunting perspective, yeah. you know, it's actually, you know, packing up camp and going to the hotel, may be a good survival strategy. It's maybe not the best hunting strategy because <laughs> a lot of times the animals yeah. are moving at the edges of those. Right. So yeah, you yeah. might be watching Netflix in your hotel, but <laughs> the, the likelihood of the animal is, it, being in your uh, cooler is going to be less. So, yeah. and, and it goes to, I mean, it also goes to winter trips and stuff like we had, 
you know, like Dave and Amy Freeman, they won Matt Geo's Adventure of the Year Award maybe in 2014 or something. They used our shelters primarily for a year in the Boundary Waters. They stayed in the wilderness for a year. They traveled by canoe, by dog sled. You know, it got cold. It got, I went in in March, I think it was, and visited them. And it got negative eight when I was in there with them. Oh, and um, stuff. But, I mean, so it, they had negative 30, relatively common, you know. And uh, they did not leave the wilderness for a year. It wasn't wow. like they were going to just be like, oh, there's a big holy grail of a storm coming. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. You know, we'll come back to this in a few days. You know, no, they stayed, you know. In fact, when I met Dave, he met me at the wilderness boundary. He did not leave wilderness for a year. Wow. wow. Was this for a, uh, a documentary or what, what was the reason? Yeah. Behind it was part trip. of the it was part of the Save the Boundary Waters initiative from okay. the mining up there that they were proposing. Okay. So they wanted to shed light on it. And it is cool. And I mean Dave and Amy are fantastic people. I love yeah. them. They have this uh wilderness uh wilderness school or something like that online. Um and you know, Patagonia helped with a film on that and you know, and so what I was doing, like they had people that brought in resupplies every now and then. So I took in a resupply for a couple of weeks. And as a side benefit, I got to cruise around with sled dogs for a while, which was pretty cool with me. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, so going back a little bit to the, um, just product development, um, your shelters with the zipperless, uh, entry system, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a pretty awesome concept. Um, Thank you. tell us a little about your, you know, how, how you came up with that? How did you develop that? I can't. <laughs> I'm kidding. I saw something, you know, a lot of times there's ideas that, that bring ideas that bring ideas. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we had the little bug out shelter system, which was the three part shelter. And one part of it was if it was just pitched as a base only or a base and vestibule, there was this beak that you would guy out. And I always thought, man, I wonder if I could make that beak longer. I could make it move or whatever. And um, like maybe I could make something go up and down on this and use like a, a prusik or something for tension. And um, because, I mean, I was on the rescue team at the time, and there you would use like prusik stuff and things like that for tension on ropes a yeah. lot. And so it was kind of – taking those two ideas and putting them together a little bit. And I sat on the idea for years, probably three, four years. And I talked to we had this kid, Luke Fowler, who he's a designer, uh, but he was fresh out of school at the time working for us, told the idea to him. He was like, nah, that'll never work. You know? <laughs> and um, finally I kept like working on it kind of just, in the back of my mind, it just kept kind of spinning back there. It's like, it's like that little thing of windows when it's going to do its blue screen of death and it just, yeah. sits there and just starts <laughs> going the whole time. Yeah. And, um, I was like, I got to try it. Just curiosity killed the cat. I got to try it once, you know, and I drew it up with a specific geometry that I thought would make it work. And it, um, uh, worked. Um, so, so right. But I was like, oh, this will work. Um, and then, then there was some testing, you know, and uh, the testing, you want the funny testing story. Um, so I didn't know how we were going to do the tension. At the time, I thought, I'll do some little prusik thing here and just move it up and down. That'll hold. Um, guess how much that prusik burns on your fingers? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> So that, I imagine that, it burns a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it does. So I was like, okay, that's not going to work. So I ordered all these little, <laughs> I ordered all these little tension devices, and I was out archery hunting. I had, I was traditional archery hunting. I was camped at right about timberline, and I would swap out these devices, right, and see like if they kind of worked or didn't work or whatever. And I knew in the back of my mind. I could design the little tension device, but I really wanted something off the shelf and real reliable. Um, so I tried a couple different devices and one day I went out 
hunting from my shelter and I had these two devices on there and I probably hiked three, four miles away from camp. It was raining, raining, raining. I had to walk through all these willows to get back to my tent. And I was kind of wet by the time I got back to my tent. And then I realized that those tension devices, I could not open from the outside of the tent. And so I had to actually crawl under the tent to get out of the rain. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is getting thrown out so quickly. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah. I, uh, so I have started doing saddle hunting. I'm not sure if you've, if, if you've heard of saddle hunting, but I use a, a, a prussic on my rappel line out of the tree. Oh, yeah. um, so I, I can just imagine how much a, a smaller diameter cord uh, will heat up because my, you know, my prussic cord gets pretty hot when I'm uh, backing up that, re that rappel. So yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine. imagine. Yeah. Um, so let's change gears. Not that I want to stop talking about shelters, but for the sake of time, we'll change gears from shelters to your packs. Something that we noticed in the research is that a lot of your hunting packs look similar to kind of a, a design that we see really frequently in the ultralight pack world with a big outside pocket on the back and then very accessible side pockets. Um, was this a game of chicken and egg for you? Like what came first? Did you see these designs and were inspired or is this something that just made sense for you and that, and that's where that came from? Oh no, those designs were there, but they didn't perform up to the framing and suspension. Like I, I had a ULA, I had a couple of ULAs, um, but I couldn't, I had modified the frame in one to try to be able to carry 60, 70 pounds. And even if I modified the frame, the stitching wasn't up to stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the framing wasn't like what we had now, but this would be a story as well. Um, at the time, everyone on the hunting forums, people were talking about all these packs that they loved or whatever, right? And I had one, I held out a bear with it. I hated it, my hips were sore for weeks. Um, so as one of my testers, before we ever made packs, um, one of my testers was an old Dana design, the external frame one that had like the lumber pad and all that. It had like two gazillion pockets. So I packed in for this elk hunt and the elk hunt was a dry elk hunt. So I had to drop about 1500 feet to get water every day. Um, from the spot. So I packed in for this elk hunt and I got this pack that has the two gazillion pockets. And I realized that what I needed was a master pocket that told me where everything was because I would always start like, where's my head like this, this, this. And I'd be like, oh, found it in pocket number nine. You know, um, that, that high organization million pocket things really didn't work for me. And finally on maybe like day four of the hunt, I went down to get water and I was like, screw this. I avoided the F word. That's what I really wanted to say. <laughs> um, um, try to keep your podcast PG. Yeah. Uh, so I said, screw this. And uh, walked all the way back to my car and grabbed my ultralight pack. And uh, that, that was, it was a ULA. And I was like, I just I could have used another expletive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I knew where stuff was in it, even though it only had one pocket. <laughs> and yeah. um, I, when I ended up being done with the elk hunt, first off, I think the giant external frame might have cost me the opportunity at Bull of a Lifetime, which I knew was hanging out in that area. And because I just wasn't able to move very well in the woods. So mm -hmm. I hunted the rest of the time with this other pack. And when it came time to pack out, I actually carried that big, heavy external in my hand while I wore the other pack out. Um, wow. And then if we're getting into some of the genesis, uh, there was a external frame pack I had bought at a thrift store for like five bucks. But the um, 
frame was a little bent, uh, but it was a small external frame, um, like 10 inches wide. The frame was a little bent. And so I fixed the frame and I kept looking at that whenever hunting season would come around. And I would be like, you know, if you could put a minimal pack bag on this, this would almost do the trick, you know, and it's so simple and elegant. And mm -hmm. then a customer of ours went on an elk hunt and I was gracious enough to kind of tell him where I thought elk would be, um, which I've long since stopped doing. Um, <laughs> so the, um, and he actually, his first ever elk hunt, he got a 320 bull. Um, he had all these packs that he thought were top end packs. It rained, it sleeted. They gained about three pounds of water. He hated his pack by the time he got done. I was carrying an old Osprey packing out from the nineties, uh, when they were made in Dolores still. Um, and he got really intense about wanting to find a pack that worked. So he started buying all these packs and testing them. And from there, we just ended up kind of making a pack business. And I thought from that external frame, I thought, you know, very simple and direct was the best way to go. Yeah um on the load transfer and from gaining three pounds of water weight and sleet and rain and all the blood soak in i thought x pack is the way to go and i mean we got so much flack from the hunters we did yeah. because hunters have a tendency to be more conservative in their approach not just politically and not talking about guns or anything but just in their approach they're like mm -hmm. well and they don't necessarily some of them at the time were more avid backpackers in the summer, but a lot of them were like, I hunt when it's hunting season, you know, and I do everything for hunting. Right. So they weren't necessarily aware of what was going on and more of the lightweight ultralight world, as far as where yeah. some of those designs were going and were possibly more efficient, but definitely were more efficient than what the hunting community was providing. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you make a, a pack that, you know, comfortably carries 90 pounds? You know, you, you, you have both internal and external frame packs. Um, what, what's the, what's the secret there? I think there's a little bit of a difference for everyone in their body type. Um, we, our bigger packs are probably to some people frustratingly complex to fit, but it's the only way that you can dial in practically a custom fit to really fit your body. Now, if they have the knowledge or desire to get that out of it is another story, which is kind of where the flight was. The flight was conceptually a compliment as much simpler, right? Um, you have to have pretty solid framing. That, that's the okay. first thing you have to have a frame yeah. that's going to support the bulk of that weight. Um, and so we chose aircraft aluminum in a tubular form because it was literally the most direct way to get strength outside of carbon. We messed with some carbon stuff when we were designing and testing, but we didn't have great, co uh, great uh, confidence in it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is you have to get a belt that stays relatively put. And conceptually, we went a different route than most were at the time. The belt, most packs still are the three-piece belt that has a lumbar pad and two wings. Problem is a lot of times those wings go like this, right? Um, when yep. things get heavily loaded, and then some manufacturers will put heavy plastic or something to try to stabilize this, but that also will rub your hips pretty sore too if you tighten the pack a lot and not necessarily be super comfortable. Um, we went with the concept of that the belt should conform and like if you take a belt just a belt doesn't even have to be a backpacking belt and you tighten up your belt it's not going to go down your pants with weight on it if it conforms to your body well so we went with softer foams and softer things uh, we have since added the ability to capture the belt and put a lumbar pad on it which makes it 
feel much more like the traditional three-piece design. And there are some benefits to that. Like I actually like that because it holds the belt more upright and it's less likely to flop into the snow if you're like mm. out in late October or November. Um, from a carry standpoint, I can do either type fairly well um, and both will work for me. Technically, if you want to really dive down into the technical stuff, frankly, a lumbar, a sticky lumbar pad on a full wrap belt with top and bottom adjustment, I believe is prop that is relatively soft in its approach. So it's conforming is probably the best that you will get um, from just a technical thing. Now, the sticky has drawbacks. If you're wearing light layers, a lot of times a sticky lumbar pad will end up abrading your back. Um, so we actually provide a 3D mesh, but we will, I will say the 3D mesh, certain clothing can cause the belt to slip more than other clothing. Like if you wore a, a fleece or wool and threw on, say, 75 pounds, walked mm -hmm. around with it, it might never slip and might be it just perfect right but if you yeah. threw on a lightweight polyester breathable base layer or a cortex rain jacket it might be all over the place so there is some variability there it seems like a dance between uh flexibility and structure you need enough that can stay put that's going to be really stable and really solid and enough that can move around that solid piece is that is that right <laughs> That is pretty much right. Like our frame has some movement to it like this, but yeah. it tightens up when you tighten everything. Um, and you need to be able to move around, especially uh, in the woods if you're hunting in timber and things like that. People find the flexibility more comfortable. And I would say that our framing, I kind of take frames and I – put them into two categories, one which is a conformance frame, which means that it attempts to uh, fit the back profile of everybody, which is going to be all over the board, right? Yeah. Um, and then another, and then ours I would call an avoidance frame, which acts as a more supportive out, outside layer of structure. So it kind of goes around you and then comes up. So it's not near as picky. Uh, mm -hmm what your back structure is, and it provides actually sort of an exterior structure. Yeah. So it looks like uh, a lot of your packs now are being made with Ultra. Is that correct? Every single one. Every one of them. So tell me, tell me a little about, you know, why you decided to go that route with Ultra um, and just fabric choice for packs in general. Especially with what you said about hunters being more conservative. I mean, that's a new fabric in the yeah. grand scheme of things. Yeah, definitely. We like to be what's the saying? All gas, no brakes. When it comes to uh, <laughs> when it comes to performance, so yeah. so we really like to keep our pedal to the metal on that. Um, we have been using X Pac mm -hmm. for years, and we'd also been using some Spectra Grid. Um, a few years ago, Spectra wanted to get more into the backpacking stuff. And so they asked us to build some sample packs for them. And they gave us quite a big thing of some sample fabrics they were thinking of. And one was a completely woven spectra. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And so we built them packs for that. Um, we loved the completely woven spectra. We wanted to get a waterproof coating on it. At that time, they were requiring bigger numbers and this and that. And so we ended up working with them on the spectra grid, which really punched above its weight class because the spectra ripstop part of it is actually larger than the high tenacity nylon in it. Um, and we put a moderate waterproof coating because we were trying to, you know, cause some hunters did complain that things were too noisy, but then the guy from that was the primary person at DP um, contacted us about the Ultra, working with another company. I'm sure you guys know who we're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. And we took a look at it, and we said, this is awesome. And so we built some packs, did some testing. We probably sent out 20 or 30 packs um, with it for testing. 
it can the testing came out fantastic. Everyone's feedback was fantastic. So we ended up offering a two staged thing, one which was their 400 denier and their wolf gray, which was meant to be more of a hunter natural neutral color and then the high performance um, ultra, which we also really liked the looks of it combined with the spectra grid. We considered it pretty much a waterproof pack and true story. We, I had a new version of it. Three of us had a new version on a fishing trip on the Kasilov in Alaska and it rained its ass off and it's actually meant to be more of an EDC panel loader pack. And we barely had any water in our packs at all. It was just a little clammy inside. And we got rained on for six or seven hours. And the packs were sitting in water in the bottom of the boat. Yeah. Um, and wow. it was a full panels up style pack. So um, new for 23 is where that's going to be. But um, it ended up that the sales were so tilted towards the ultra that it really didn't make much. And we were clear in our communication with people. We thought the wolf was the best 400 denier that we ever touched, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a little quieter, had a nice feel to it, a nice color. Um, and um, But 95% of the people were buying Ultra. So we said, screw it. We're an Ultra company. Let's make this simple. Why make it hard yeah. on ourselves? Yeah. Interesting. If you don't mind me asking... Uh, how do you all manage the seam slippage that people like to talk about? Uh, one thing we try to do here in the podcast for people is help, technically speaking, with ways that they want to make their gear. Um, and especially with heavy weights, that's a huge concern for people that are not well-versed when working with Ultra. What would you recommend to them? Well, we do, uh, we do a basic grow grain binding on all the seams. Uh, we get criticized for that approach from the true ultralighters because it adds an ounce, ounce and a half. Um, it also does provide a slightly challenging place for if you're dunking your bag and really want to make it absolutely waterproof. It does provide uh, some ability for some wicking. Although in real world stuff, I think it's short of dunking. It's really kind of overblown concerns. Yeah. We have not had any issues there with that whatsoever um, with our construction methods. And we also do all of our all of our loops, all of our compression loops. They are sewn into the seam, back tacked, and then they have the grow grain binding as well. And it just has not been an issue whatsoever. I think it's good for people to hear, honestly. Just I, I don't think sometimes people I, well, just me, but I've seen it with other people as well. We think when you hear something like that, you think of the worst case scenario. And I don't think people often think of Grogren as being enough. Um, so it's great to hear a company where, again, it's not like you're not putting really heavy loads on these seams and on these places. So, you know, use it being smart about your stitch length and going over some Grogren. It's kind of simple. And that's if that's enough, then that's really good. I think people want to hear that. You know, it's one of those things that people, we take so much flack on the lightweight side, sites for really like what I would call the last ounce or two. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like the ultralighters seem to get mad at us for not going the last ounce or two. Like I could, I could make a frame like ours and I could make a pack like ours and I could probably... And I make a belt like ours. I could probably shave four ounces if I really wanted to, right? But the level of durability that it would cost would be pretty substantial um, in yeah. the long run. And, you know, we had a guy last year on one of the tester packs. He hauled out a sheep 16 miles on foot. Jeez. <laughs> you know, in the two track in October. In, in the yeah. Chugash in Alaska. Yeah. Um, you know, we had people that packed out tons of animals with them, and there was never any issue. We we take things, and we try to shock load them because that's where – so it might be something like load 100 pounds and 
start doing the equivalent of jumping jacks, you know, <laughs> while it's on your back, you know, to try to shock load. Yeah. And we did have, we did the, the seam issue you talk about. We had a little bit of that issue in just pure fundamental testing, you know, just like let's sew two things of fabric together and see if we can get this. But by we also went with the recommended needle size, which was a little mm -hmm. smaller than what we had been using, and a couple other little and the grow grain, and it became not an issue. Mm, yeah. So we're going to wrap up here, Kevin, for the sake of time. And we've got one more fun question to ask you. Hunting season's coming up, if not already here, for many people, depending on, on where you live. And for people listening, a lot of us are making our, our own gear or some of our own gear at home. What would you recommend, other than some of the bigger items like a shelter or a pack that uh, obviously we could recommend, uh, maybe a company called Seek Outside, but for some smaller items for people that want to make their own gear, what would you recommend they make a few small items for their hunting season upcoming or, the, or things that you've made you know that does it have to be stuff that is provided by ripstop no it can be any project that you can imagine okay okay i would actually make different i would actually make gators um that would be one um i would what use would you a, make them out of i would Oops, probably, sorry, you in there I would probably make them out of Neo shell. Mm, um, okay. You know, I like a little stretch in yeah. the gators um, instead of the, what feels like a hard shell gator. And mm -hmm. they're also kind of uh, the hard shell gators are kind of noisy when you wear them as well. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a, well, people wear gators a lot. I think there's a little bit of cost attached to them, and the show would be quieter, waterproof enough, mm -hmm. um, and have a little bit of stretch in it as well. So I would size them a little small and use the stretch to conform. Um, what else would I do? Um, people could always make themselves a bino harness. I don't really use bino harnesses myself. I... Uh, I think that uh, bino harnesses are so – you end up taking them on and off so much. If you start up – say you start at a trailhead at 8,000 feet in mid-October and you hike up to a ridge at 11,000 and hunt around and come in, come back during the night or during late – you are in and out of shells so many times. It's a little windy, yeah. a little this. I mean – the bino harness, the bino harness, and frankly, a lot of times, at least me, when I'm putting on those big effort days, I get a little loopy in the head, you know, and um, yeah. it's a little easy to leave something. And last thing I want to do is leave a uh, thousand some, dollar pair of binoculars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. I differ from a lot of hunters in that regard and yeah i i i'm more minimalist um i use like the rick young bino harness a lot of times and so it's just like underneath and then i use well an active kind of shell and then i mm -hmm. really just put like a shell over it right and i don't mm -hmm. i don't have to take stuff on and off near as much but i favor like things like being able to find my tent versus uh, <laughs> having a camo tent on a hillside somewhere. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so, yeah, if I had a camo tent, like a lot of people would like us to make, I would throw some orange all over that sucker. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> as the sun's going down, the last thing I want to be doing is like, where is that dang tent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Awesome. Well, Kevin, this has been super fun. Thanks for sharing this time and this information. We really appreciate you uh, being on the podcast. No worries. It's been fun. Have a good one.